Welcome, folks, and thank you for coming today. Um, this is our first class in a series we're going to be doing. We're, we're planning to do about one class a month, and we're trying to time them according to what you should be doing in your yard at that, that month. Um, so the first class is Vegetable Gardening in North Carolina. My name's Shannon Hathaway, and I'm an outside sales consultant here at, at SuperSod. Um, vegetable gardening, gardening in general is my passion, but I love growing edibles in my garden, and I, anytime I can talk to people about that and share that experience, I'm happy. Those of you who've lived in North Carolina long enough know that our soil is miserable. It is hard clay, it's filled with rocks, sometimes there's sand, but you never see beautiful, rich, black soil unless you've bought, you've been fortunate enough to buy a gardener's home where they've put a lot of work into it. Most of us aren't that lucky. So what we always recommend is you raise your beds, particularly for vegetables. Vegetables need to put in good deep roots and they have one year to do it. It's not like a tree that has many, many years to put in good deep roots. So you wanna go up above that heavy compacted soil that we have in North Carolina. So starting a vegetable garden right in your clay is gonna be a very frustrating, miserable experience. You want to come up at least six inches, eight to 10 is even better, um, and do a raised bed. It allows your, your roots to go deep into the soil. You're not walking on that bed, so you're not compacting the soil. Um, and having a raised bed discourages foot traffic, especially the kind of the perfect width for a raised bed is four feet wide because you can walk around it and reach in from all sides. You start getting an eight foot wide vegetable bed and you have to walk into the middle. The whole point is to not have to walk into the middle. The higher the bed, the deeper the roots can go. So if you're growing something like carrots that need to put in, you know, a significant root, you want to raise your bed even higher and sometimes stacking beds makes a lot of sense. We recommend our Doc's Raised Garden Kit. It's not treated with any chemicals. It pegs together easily, so easily I can do it, so I'll show you outside how that works. And um, it comes with one big yellow bag of our soil cubed compost, fills two garden kits. So a little bit about our native soil. We have red clay, it's very heavy. It makes great pottery, that's why we have such, such wonderful potters here in North Carolina, but not so good for plants to grow in. It's low in nutrients. It's difficult for plants to put in good deep roots. Um, it holds water, but then it dries and cracks and can damage plants. So we recommend lasagna gardening, which is the way nature gardens, and that's in layers. If you think about it, leaves fall down, plants rot, they start to form a compost layer, that turns to soil, new leaves are falling, it's layer upon layer upon layer. And that's really, you know, anytime we can follow nature's example, we're doing good gardening practices. Vegetables use up nutrients very quickly because they have one year. Most of our vegetables are annuals, and so they've got one year to do all their growing, so they're very hungry. Um, the growth cycle's fast, demanding, and we need to provide those nutrients if we're gonna get a good yield. Chemical fertilizers, while they're great to get your three basic nutrients to the plants, they do nothing to add or encourage beneficial soil organisms. They're not giving them any trace minerals, anything like that. So you're better off putting compost, good soil in, than putting in chemical fertilizers. If you add compost every year, you're replenishing some of the nutrients that those, those vegetables are taking out of the soil. Tomatoes are the hungriest plants out there when it comes to nutrients. Um, so it's often recommended too, not only to add compost to your tomato beds, but to switch out where you plant your tomatoes every year, rotate your crops. That's what farmers do. They know what they're doing. They're good at it. We need to use them as an example. We recommend our soil cubed. It is pure organic compost that we make at our sod farms. We make it out of grass clippings, wheat straw, and cow manure turn it constantly and keep it at a temperature of 160 degrees to try to kill off all the weed seeds that are in there. We inoculate it with mycorrhiza and other beneficial organisms to help because they're in there eating and decomposing. Um, and it is certified by OMRI, the um, Organic Materials Resource Institute. 
And what their, their certification means that it's okay for use in organic vegetable gardens. And the reason for that is we use no residual <coughs> pesticides. So where to put your vegetable garden? I go to so many people's houses and you get there in the morning and boy is it sunny, but by afternoon that area is not going to be sunny or vice versa. Um, vegetables, most vegetables need six or more hours of direct sunlight per day. There are some that can handle a little more shade. Um, peppers, believe it or not, can take a little bit more shade. But ideally, you want to situate your vegetable garden where it's getting at least six hours of sun. A nearby water source is helpful because with a raised bed, it's going to dry out a little quicker than, than planting in the ground. So you want to be able to get the, in there and water as much as possible. Protecting your plants from high winds is important um, so that things aren't getting knocked down, battered, and so that their leaves aren't drying out. Dry, uh, high winds will desiccate the leaves, dry them out, and make it harder for the plant to survive. And then fencing. Um, in Cary, believe it or not, we have a lot more wild animals than you would think. I have seen a coyote on uh, Maynard Road. So oh, um, we have lots and lots of animals that are going to say, oh, look at this wonderful garden. So if, if you're seeing deer, rabbits, Raccoon. woodchucks, raccoons, exactly. You may want to fence off your garden. Squirrels. And squirrels are everywhere. I have, if you find a way to prevent squirrels, let me know. <laughs> and then check your HOA covenants if you have an HOA. There are some that don't like you to have vegetable gardens. I don't like rules that tell me I can't have vegetable gardens, but just make sure you check so that you don't invest in this and find out you have to take it down. If you have space limitations, a lot of people say, I'd love to garden in a, have, have a vegetable garden, but I live in a condo or I live in an apartment. Um, so square foot gardening is important. And we're going to talk about that outside. I'll demonstrate some of the techniques of square foot gardening. But what it means is to plant as much in a square foot as you possibly can and to allow um, companion plants, some that grow up, some that grow sideways, um, and then use pots. Uh, there is out on the market now there are lots of new patio tomatoes container tomatoes that you can put in a container they don't get as big but they get a, a heavier stem it's it's a tougher plant in a sense and you get just as much yield on it without having to have a four or five foot tomato cage and then you can add vegetables into your perennial and annual beds, and that's one way to hide vegetables if you're not allowed to have a vegetable garden. Um, it's, and that's the British style of gardening. If you can raise your perennial beds up and keep mounding the soil so it's good, you can actually work vegetables and herbs into your perennial and annual beds. They're beautiful. I think they work just fine that way. And then timing. So when you came in along the back, if you didn't get one, I think there may still be some more. Um, I've got a zone seven planting chart. It tells you when to plant what. We are so fortunate here. We can plant early spring vegetables. We can plant your, your traditional summer vegetables that you're harvesting in July or August. And then we can come back in in August and put in fall vegetables. I grew up in Massachusetts where we had to wait till May 31st to get our tomatoes in the ground. And you had a very brief period of time to grow vegetables. Here in North Carolina, we have a very long period of time to grow vegetables. So it's, it's easy to, to rotate your crops, get new things in and keep the harvest going as long as you can. Um, consecutive crops is another way to do it. So if you plant peas one week, wait a week or 10 days, plant more peas. And the same with your tomatoes. Plant some tomatoes right at April 15th wait a couple of weeks plant some more tomatoes because what it's going to take them you'll see on the um lit the information that comes with your plant it'll tell you how many days to fruit production so if you're delaying planting some things you're going to extend that crop time and then rotate your crops in a three-year cycle so if you've got one bed that you're putting tomatoes in move the tomato if three beds is ideal but you know if you can move your tomatoes to the next bed and then the next bed and bring them back to that first bed in the um the, the fourth year that way you are um extending that the life of the soil the nutrient life of the soil keeping a journal is a great thing to do and i'm i'm not as good about it as i should but i do have my vegetable garden 
um, journal. I talk about when I ordered my hops, I keep my, um, the seed packets here so I know exactly what I planted when rather than just labeling everything in the garden, I keep it here if I'm growing things from seed. And then if you're looking for a book, this one is my favorite. It's from Taunton. It's called Growing Vegetables and Herbs. I think I got this at Barnes and Noble. Um, and it is just so detailed. Even to the end, it gives you some recipes. It's, it gives you so much information and on some unusual vegetables and things too. So not just your basic tomatoes and peppers. Pest and disease control. So that's always a big control, concern here in um, North Carolina. We have um, lots of bugs. <laughs> so what you want to think about is integrated pest management and what that, it's called IPM in the, in the trade. And what it means is, it, is assessing whether they're acceptable levels of damage or not. Because the fewer chemicals you can put on your fruits and vegetables, let's face it, the better they are for you. So if you're looking at a plant and, and it's got a hole or two in it, something's been nibbling on it, don't panic. You have to say, okay, I've got a threshold I can allow, and usually it's up to 20% of the plant damage. If I can allow that critter to eat 20% of that leaf, that's fine, and then I don't have to spray anything. When something is defoliating your plant, then you have to start to think about what, what you're gonna do to get rid of that plant, or re rid of that pest, sorry. Um, you can plant Flowers and herbs that deter pests, attract pollinators and deter pests. So um, many of you may have had grandmothers who planted marigolds around their tomatoes. There was a reason for that. It wasn't just that the yellow and orange flowers look great with the red tomatoes. Um, the, there are lots of insects like the tomato hornworm, hornworm, caterpillar, things like that, that hate marigolds. Something about the smell a chemical they release, they don't like them. So it's, it's a good, companion plants are a good way to keep pests off. I have lots of roses. I plant rosemary under my roses and around them. It keeps lots of the bad bugs off the roses. It also keeps the deer away. The deer don't like rosemary. They don't like um, any of the, the oily or aromatic herbs. They don't like lavender, that sort of thing. So that's a natural way to do it. Um, if you're trying to control fungal diseases, the best way is to pick up any leaves that fell down on the ground. Because if they sit there and they're starting to decompose and it's moist, that's when you get fungal diseases and they can go up and onto the plant. So if you, especially if you're seeing fungal diseases and the leaves are dropping, clean those leaves up. And then water consistently. We see a lot of problems with tomatoes where they'll get a rot on the bottom or they'll burst open. Now, if we have heavy rainstorms, you can't control that. But if you're watering inconsistently, then the plant is, is liable to either wilt or soak up too much of that water and split open. So try to keep consistent watering. Now, let's go outside and get our hands dirty. All right, these are our Doc's garden bed kits. This will be a little like a cooking show where, you know, we show you how to put it together and then we pull the already finished one out of the oven. Um, they are so easy to put together. I had an email yesterday from someone saying, can I build this myself or do you need to come out and do it? If I can build it, you can build it. So it's a simple peg together system. You slide in and you just push a peg into the back. Whoop. Slid the peg all the way through. 30 seconds to assembly. Really, really easy. Um, and you're done, right? Except you have to fill it. So someone asked a great question earlier. What if you're setting it down on top of grass? You don't care about the grass that's underneath it very much. Well, we at Superside here care very much about grass. But if you're putting your, your garden bed there, the best solution I've found is to line it with newspaper. The newspaper will kill the grass because it's not going to allow it to get any sunlight or any water for a little while. And then the newspaper breaks down, the grass breaks down and contributes nitrogen to your vegetable garden. You want to fill this with gardening soil, right? 
My favorite gardening soil of course is our soil cubed, pure compost. I do that in all my raised vegetable beds. I put it in my house plants. I top dress my lawn with it. I top dress my annual and perennial beds with it. It is, it's incredible stuff. So you have a four by eight vegetable garden and you want to cram as many things into it as possible. That's called square foot gardening. Let's get the most impact out of a small space as you possibly can. So the first thing we think about is growing vertically. Um, I've gotten some very simple wooden gardening stakes here. You can use sticks, you can use whatever you want. But it's as simple as pushing them down into the soil. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a trellis for um, climbing vegetables like cucumbers. Go right up the trellis. Wrong end. Here we go. So I stick four of those in. Take my handy dandy soil knife. This is my favorite tool. It cuts, it digs, it measures. I love this thing. Now I want to cut just a few lengths. I'm going to lash the um, cross pieces onto the uprights. Now you're going to see my awesome rope skills, which aren't all that great, but we'll see. Um, yeah, if you don't mind grabbing an end, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Just stabilize that end. Just simply lash this together, hold it into place. And what we're doing is providing a strong framework for the vegetables to climb up. This one is not going to be perfect by any means, but... It'd be a lot sturdier being able to push these into the subsoil too. Exactly. We're, we're going down and hitting concrete here. Lash these together and then my second favorite, very inexpensive, very multi-purpose gardening tool is fishing line. I use fishing line for everything. It's um, inexpensive. It's strong. If it can hold a marlin, it can hold a plant. And it's invisible. So you can make a, a, a bunch of lines of fishing line going up and around your um, with how I'm doing this, but um, a bunch of lines going up and down vertically for your climbing plants to twine around and hold on to. That's how I grow my hops at home. I grow hops because my son brews beer. And so we're growing three different kinds of hops right now. So then I simply stick a few thumbtacks into the docks kit. and start with my fishing line. Notice how you barely even see it. Just loop it around a little, take it over to the next one, loop it around a little, come back down. You can use push pins, you can use nails, whatever you want to secure that. Um, eye hooks are, or uh, eye bolts are great. Now you can do that as many times around, going up and down, giving as many climbing surfaces as you can. They climb right up these um, supports and then they're not rambling across the garden. So we've jammed those into as little space as possible. We're gonna grow our, our cucumbers vertically. So then you wanna think about your larger vegetables. 
going down to your smaller. So of course, your largest are always, at least in my experience, going to be your tomatoes. Um, so you want to give them some space. Every year I make the same mistake. I try to jam way too many tomatoes into my garden. But you want to give them at least 18 inches between. And I like to zigzag them. It allows more airflow in between. So now I've got three tomatoes. I can do a line of um, cucumbers along the back or peas or anything you want that climbs up. And then we've got peppers. Peppers need a little height too, but not as much space as the tomatoes. So we go with the same kind of zigzagging process. Peppers are going out in front of the tomatoes because they're not gonna get quite as tall. So now we want some things that crawl in between and spill out over the edge because again, we wanna take advantage of, we've got a lot of open space in here, a lot of real estate. So I've got crook's neck squash and I've got zucchini here and I can plant those in these spaces in between. They're not gonna compete up. They're gonna go and spill out over the edges of the vegetable garden. it will naturally put out tendrils and climb on its own. I like making the plants do all the work. <laughs> as much of it as possible, at least. Let's see. So I've got some eggplant, which you can actually use climbing here. This is um, the Ichiban Japanese eggplant. Delightful flavor, delightful texture. I love that plant. And then I work in herbs, because we talked about the fact that um, got a couple of these so I can work these in here as well. Um, we talked about how some of the fragrance of the herbs keeps some of the bad bugs off the plants. Dill is going to bring in pollinators. You'll get lots of um, butterflies and bees and things around your dill. So bringing that towards the front of the bed. Again we're staying with the taller things towards the back, the shorter things towards the front. So I've got some purple basil, I've got a little culinary sage and some Thai basil, and I've got rosemary. Rosemary is going to be one of your larger herbs, so you want that towards the back, it or towards the the back of the the herb parts anyway, um, and it's going to keep a lot of bad bugs as well as potentially some of the mammals away from your garden. They don't like the smell, so I've got a little Thai basil here some culinary sage and then another one of my favorite ground cover herbs we can tuck in in the middle it's oregano this is Greek oregano and that will just creep and crawl in under the tomatoes too I still have room for more <laughs> isn't that great huh yeah canning is one of my favorite things to do um, any questions so far before we move on to potatoes yes you need a lot of it a lot of it. I actually have, the way I have my own vegetable gardens, I have a row of roses because my homeowners association gets a little confused with some of the things I do. <laughs> we'll leave it at confused. I have a row of roses and a row of rosemary so they can't really see the raised beds. All they see is this beautiful border of roses and rosemary and that helps to keep some of the rabbits out I do occasionally see a rabbit every so often, but if, if I can border that whole veg vegetable area in plants they don't like, it helps. Any other questions? Garlic. I'm sorry? Garlic. garlic doesn't really help. Um, it's funny. <laughs> I've heard that adding either garlic or hot pepper to oil and spraying it on your bird seed keeps the squirrels out of it. I think I have Cajun squirrels. They just love the hot pepper. They love the garlic. They're, they just, they, it doesn't stop them at all. So some of, the, some of these organic things work really well. Some of them, not so well. A couple years ago, I found on Pinterest, the coolest way to do potatoes. Potatoes require super deep soil, super rich soil, and yes, I can stack some boxes, some of these boxes and grow potatoes. 
Um, potatoes themselves aren't all that expensive, but the ones I like are those little itty bitty ones that are in the um, little mesh container and you get this much for $3.99. I'm growing my own. Um, <laughs> so what we did yesterday, I brought in a couple of these, just a couple big baking potatoes. And a day before you're going to plant them, you need to heal them. And what that means is to let them dry out so they look nice and ugly like this. So we cut them into sections. If they're already growing little roots out of them, cool, but you, they don't need to be. And I left them outside on paper overnight so that they form a scab here so that they don't rot. And that's the most important part. So you simply take a potato and you cut sections about that big. So you can cut up as many sections as you want. So if you're getting those little itty bitty potatoes that I'm going to be growing at home, I'm going to be doing this probably next week. I'll, next weekend I'll be doing my potatoes. Um, you really only cut those in half. That's all you have to do to get just some small pieces. And then you get a sturdy tomato cage, not the little flimsy ones, but we've got these inside for sale. These are tough. And that's what you really want is this sturdy tomato cage because it's about to become a potato cage. And then you take wheat straw, <laughs> that handy dandy knife again. And you line the inside of it, kind of make a nest with the wheat straw, okay? So I'm going to fill that cavity I've created with compost. And we're going to do layer upon layer upon layer all the way up. So once I've got it to the top of where I had the wheat straw, grab some more wheat straw and continue to make our nest all the way up. I find wheat straw is better for this than pine straw. It holds moisture better. And because we're going up, we're gardening vertically. We want to be able to hold as much moisture in as we possibly can. This is the messy part of the job. Like I said, this is where you get your hands dirty. And what's going to happen is your potatoes are going to start to come out, the leaves and the branches, all the way from the bottom to the top of this tower. It looks really cool as it grows. Too, because you want the plants to come out. They're going to come out in between the layers. And their roots are, the plant roots are going to stabilize this whole thing. So those little fingerling potatoes that you're seeing in the markets now, the little purple ones and yellow ones, and they're nice and creamy and delicious, very expensive. Buy one of those, cut the pieces up, do one of, like this, do one of these towers. How many pounds of potatoes do you think you can produce out of one of these towers? 100 a year, 100 pounds of potatoes. <laughs> in one potato tower a year. Enough to share with all your neighbors and all your friends. <laughs> you have to worry about what? 
<laughs> you really don't because they're not going to have a way to get in there. You know, the wind's uh, other than maybe in the top, the wind's not going to blow them in. They're not going to um, come up through the bottom. That's a long way up. And what about pests? Pests, potato beetles, you, you kind of pick off for the most part. I'm, I'm very into, I know you don't like grabbing the bugs. <laughs> I, I've got a very, um, I get a lot of satisfaction out of grabbing and squishing bugs. <laughs> I talk to them while I do it. <laughs> Call them various names. So we're all the way up at the top of the cage now. And before I put that last bit of compost in, I'm going to put my potatoes in. And all I do is they're, they're hard little nuggets. They've been left out overnight. Doesn't matter, dried side doesn't matter. Just put them in in kind of a loose circle. I've put five of those in there. That's five potato plants we're going to get. You can mix them up. You can use a chunk from five different potatoes. You put a little more compost on the top. And you sit back and wait. And it's really cool. You're gonna get branches that come out here, leaves. It's gonna look really sculptural. Yes, ma'am? So you said you put a potato in each layer where you put the... Nope, nope, potatoes are just up near the top. Because what you're eating is part of the root system. So now you want potatoes, right? Well, how do you dig all the way to the bottom? You don't. <laughs> you grab that little knife again. You want some potatoes for dinner and you don't wanna kill the plant? You just cut in, feel around with your hand, pull a few potatoes out, close that gap. It keeps going all year. How much sun do you get off of those five? One tower can produce 100 pounds of potatoes a year. From those five little things. From those five little things. That from one potato. <laughs> that was five eyes from one potato. So how many of these before you start harvesting? Before you start harvesting, 60 to 75 depends on the potato depends on the year so you can do a little exploratory surgery go in there and kind of look and see how the potatoes are doing how big they are the bigger the potato gets like a big old russet potato is going to take longer than the little fingerling potatoes they're pretty quick again water about twice a week uh-huh water about twice a week I would, I'm going to start my next weekend, what I do, because I'm cheating a little. April 15th is generally our last frost-free date. That's moving a little bit um, with climate change, but it's um, pretty standard around April 15th. So about 10 days before April 15th, I look at the 10-day forecast and say, am I going to risk it or not? <laughs> and I've been burned a couple times doing that. but. Um, what I find right now is the selection on the vegetables is best. By April 15th, they're pretty picked over. So I go and get mine a little early. Um, someone asked earlier where the best place to buy vegetables is. My favorite is the Raleigh Farmer's Market. You are buying direct, and this is true of all the plants there, you're buying directly from the farmers. They're making a little more money than if they sell it wholesale. You're paying a little less money than you would if you're buying retail at a nursery. It's a win-win. Um, you can ask them if you go there and you're looking for something specific and they don't have it there If they're growing it, they'll bring it in the next weekend for you. They're wonderful people and there are herbs there Trees shrubs vegetables flowers you name it and you just walk from vendor to vendor go over say hi to the nice folks at super sod while you're over there and uh, Eat lunch at the, the fish <laughs> the, You get your, your uh, Cholesterol fill at the fried fish market, which is really good <laughs> So any questions? Yes. If you plant it on April 15th, uh -huh. you get to start harvesting by September. So July, yeah. June, July, maybe late June. Okay, and how long do you keep getting potatoes? Um, right until November, usually. As soon as we get a hard frost, it's going to kill that plant back. But before that, you can just keep harvesting. How much sun does that need? Um, 
more than it's getting right here. So this is a little deceptive, but we couldn't stick this down into the concrete, so we put, put it here. Um, generally, if it can get, again, six to eight hours of sun is ideal. And be prepared, potato plants are big. If you've never seen a potato plant, this thing is gonna be huge, so give it some space. Start completely over. Um, not so much that they'll get too much, it's that you'll need to water it more. That's all. Yeah, and just, you know, test your soil. A lot of people say, well, how much water? How often? How deeply? Um, if you're watering something like this, watering with a hose is really going to beat it up. But if you water, if you get a watering can with a nice big rose on the front, it distributes. And I like this because you don't just pour from here, you can pour from here. And it's, if it comes out gently out of a big, nice big rose like that, that's better than the power of the, the water coming out of the hose. So this is your friend when it comes to the potato towers and to your vegetable gardens. Or you can set up kind of a rotating um, sprinkler. Sure. So the question was, at the end of the season, what do you do with this? Because the potatoes have really kind of tired out this soil. And I think you have a great idea. Put it, don't throw it away. Put it into other areas in your garden. And in the spring, you'll need fresh wheat straw. You'll need fresh compost in there to start again for the next season. Yes, ma'am. Wheat straw doesn't break down very well. Um, it breaks down slowly. Yeah, the wheat straw I wouldn't put back in the garden. Okay. Just the compost. Does this need watering in the, right after you uh, put in this? Spray? That's always best when you're planting things to, to water right afterwards because those roots are going into new dry soil. You want to water it, encourage them to spread out. So that's, that's a great question. Yes, sir. Using your uh, soil, is there any reason to do any additional uh, treatment or fertilizing? I don't. The season? I don't do any fertilizer. One thing I do if I'm noticing um, leaves looking a little anemic in my garden, and I'm not seeing it in my vegetable gardens, but I grow a plant called comfrey. It's an old-fashioned medicinal herb. I love it. It takes over the world, so you have to be careful, but um, you take the leaves and you soak them in water, kind of chop them up and soak them in water and make comfrey tea. And I'll put that on the leaves of plants if they're looking a little yellow, a little anemic. Another really much easier, great way to do that is to make compost tea. So to, to feed your leaves on your plants, you can take compost, put it in a bucket with a lid, like a five gallon bucket, fill it up with water and let it sit. Then to put it into your, you wanna put it through like a kitchen strainer or something to put it in here because it'll clog this rose up if the, if the compost is getting in. But now you've got lovely brown water and you water the leaves with it and that gets those nutrients directly because the leaves are absorbing not you know your plants absorbing water not just through its roots but some through the leaves as well thank you folks so much for coming you've been a great audience but if you have questions um this is brad i'm gonna get choked up now he's my manager and he really um thinks it's important to hire knowledgeable people you can go to a big box store but if you come here, you're getting a family business where they really value hiring people who have backgrounds in horticulture, who can answer your questions and answer them knowledgeably, and that's to his credit. Shannon's a wealth of knowledge, so any questions you have, <laughs> she knows more than I know about that, so I know the grass, she knows the grass. <laughs>